Good evening, everyone. Some of you are awake almost. We're glad you're here tonight. It's good to be in the Lord's house, and we hope you get a blessing from this service tonight. First John chapter 5 is where we're going to be looking in the scriptures, uh, trying to um, wrap up this particular series, and chapter 5 is a wonderful chapter. As a matter of fact, First John is an amazing book. Uh, you can spend time in it and then go back and read it again, and it'll be a blessing to you. Let me just echo something that Brother uh, Ray just mentioned. If you or any of the folks watching online are looking for a church home, we'd certainly love to be um, inviting you to come here to Cherry Street Baptist Church. A wonderful place to serve the Lord. We hope that you'll think of that if that is your need. 1 John chapter 5 is where we're going to begin tonight. We're going to speak about assurance of salvation tonight or being sure of salvation are you sure that heaven is your home? That's very important. And uh, there are many wonderful truths here in this chapter that we're going to look at together. John's letter actually is a letter of assurance. He wanted his readers to know for sure that they could go to heaven and be uh, settled on that, be sure of that, and not be saying, well, I hope I make it somehow. Or maybe I can... Hold out, and maybe I can keep myself after I trust Christ. Well, there's more truth that we need to learn right here in this passage. We hope uh, it'll be a blessing to you. You know, we're sure of our forgiveness. We've had a lesson on that, and our relationship with the Lord. We can be sure of having that. Uh, we can be sure of the truth, that we know the truth, and the victory we have in Christ. And we can be sure of God's love, Brother brother. Uh, um, Bill brought that lesson, right? How do you for, how do you forget a name like Bill? You know, just, <laughs> at any rate, well, we're going to read in first first John one through five, um, verses one through five. Now, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and every one that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we. Love the children of God, and we love God and keep his commandments. Well, this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Let's pray briefly. Father, we thank you again for the opportunity to be here tonight together. I pray your blessings on your word. Help me to say exactly what you would want me to say tonight, that it might be an encouragement and help to each one. We just ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible tells us here in verses 1 through 5 that we are born of God because we trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Whosoever believeth in Jesus that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Interesting, isn't it? It tells us here, it talks about our Christian faith. The tests of a Christian are seen here in these first few verses. What are some of the ways that we know a person is a believer and that you as a believer can uh, know that you're a child of God? Well, first of all, there's faith or belief. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Notice it says, then we see the test of love and then the test of obedience. The, the evidences here of a child of God is the natural outgrowth of following the Lord in the new birth. The new birth is how we become a Christian. This is called the new birth. Jesus said to Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so that new birth is important. First of all, notice we, we show the love of God, here it says, by believing that Jesus is the Christ. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Have you been born again? Have you been born again? That question is something every person needs to answer individually. It's not something that mom or dad or grandma or grandpa can do for you or a friend or someone else. It's not something you get by osmosis, by just showing up at church and it just kind of seeps into you. No, it is a very important step of faith in your life. 
We believe that Jesus is the Christ. Not another test of being a Christian is love for the brethren, having love for others. Verse 2, he says, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. We believe, uh, we love the Lord, and you cannot love him without loving your brothers and sisters in Christ. We love him and his children. We're part of his family. Amen? We're brothers and sisters in Christ. If you're a child of God, you're my brother or sister in Christ. And I hope that you're happy about that. Amen? Because I'm happy about it. We have a lot of brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? Some are here, some are around the world, some are in other parts of the world. But we are children of God, and we love the children of God. When I got saved years ago in 1972, I was 21 years old, I found out that I just loved being around God's people. That was a natural outgrowth of my life. Just loving church, loving God's people, loving being, loving being there. And I hope that same uh, sense is in your life as well. To love the Lord. We are his family here uh, now, brothers and sisters in Christ. John also defines the love of God as keeping his commandments. It says, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. Interesting, isn't it? That's part of the Christian life, is following his commandments, his teaching. We believe the love of God, we de he defines it as keeping his commandments. In verse number three, his commandments are not grievous, as a matter of fact. In other words, we don't go around with a long face and a sad face because we are following the Lord and keeping his word and keeping his, as a matter of fact, it's a joy to know you've done what the Lord wanted you to do. Amen? Isn't it a joy to know that you've done the right thing and it's something that Jesus has told you to do and as you follow him, you find the joy. It's not grievous to follow his commands. In other words, it's not heavy, not exhausting. We... Notice that the commandments of the Lord do not crush our freedom to, to, to have the love of God in our lives. It's not a crushing thing to be a child of God. It's a joy. Jesus said, he said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Then in verse 30, he says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your soul. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. You need a lighter burden in this world. We need that lighter burden. Amen? We need that, that which the Lord uh, gives us, that ability to follow him and follow his commandments. And how we can keep his commandments is shown to us here. We're given the power of God to overcome. Verse 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is a victory. It overcometh the world, even our faith. We are given the power of God to overcome the forces of temptation by faith. I won't ask you if you've ever been tempted, because everyone is. Everyone faces some kind of temptation. Everyone will face some manner of temptation in your life, and that will come around frequently. As a matter of fact, you live in the body of flesh. This old flesh is, is, has its tendencies. Amen? And so he... Uh, places us in his family after we're saved and we overcome the world by faith in Jesus Christ. We don't have to serve those uh, fleshly temptations. We don't have to follow those. We don't have to obey those. But we can overcome them in our daily walk by the Lord's help. When you're tempted, say, Lord, help me. Lord, help me with this. I don't want to do that. I don't want to go in there. I don't want to see that. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to say that. Because whatever happens, as this world opposes us, we have victory in Christ. Verse 5, he says, Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Ladies and gentlemen, he came and brought salvation to us and everlasting life. He's given us eternal life. And he came and brought that salvation to us we claim the victory because of our Savior, because he has won the victory for us. 
You know, he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. He was tempted in every way. He was tempted in every time, in every situation, and yet he overcame that. And today we believe and trust in him and have a firm belief in him that enables us to overcome evil. You don't have to go out and serve the world, in other words. You don't have to go out and live in sin as a child of God. As a matter of fact, you can walk away from that knowing that you have joy in your life through Christ. Amen? As you know, there's so much to know and enjoy as a child of God. Whenever we believe and trust in him, he helps us, enables us to overcome evil. It's the power of God in us to proclaim the might and the superior strength of the Lord Jesus Christ over this evil world, the evil one, who's Satan. We have an enemy. He's an arch enemy. As a matter of fact, our enemy hates you. He hates me. His name is the devil. He really does hate you. He's not your friend. Amen? He hates us all, and he wants to destroy your life. He wants to destroy your testimony. And here John says we can overcome through him, through Christ, because uh, we overcome the world because we believe in the name of the Son of God. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So there's faith, there's love, and there's obedience. These are three important evidences of a child of God. Notice another part of this chapter is found, we're going to take up in verse 11. Verse 11 is another wonderful portion of this passage. It talks about the fact that we have eternal life because God's word tells us so. We have eternal life because God's word tells us so. It says, and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. This is the record. The word record there means this is the witness or the evidence or the testimony. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Ladies and gentlemen, the word witness there also comes from the word meritoria or martyr, from where we get our term martyr. Ladies and gentlemen, today many believers in the first three centuries were slain because of their faith. I believe that today we realize that there are many believers still facing the possibility of dying for their faith in our world today. As a matter of fact, in the 20th century, they say that there are more believers that are being put to death than in all the 19th centuries up to that point. It troubles me, and I know it troubles you if you're a child of God, or if you're a freedom-loving American in any way, to know that there's some people today that find themselves living in a country where it's illegal to become a Christian to the, and can be punished to the point of death. Ladies and gentlemen, and some folks, folks are paying the supreme price for their faith. And they are. What I say about that is, wow. May God help us have the faith that we would stand true to Jesus. Amen? Even in that type of situation. John writes it down like this. He says, this is the witness. This is the record. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He tells us this. God has given this everlasting, eternal life. This, life, this is life with God in his kingdom and his heaven. The only one who created everything has the ability to, and the authority to give this gift. There's only one that can give everlasting life, and that's our Lord. He is the only one with the authority to say, I will save you if you'll believe. This life, it says, is in his son. It's not a prize to be earned. Eternal life is not something we work for, but it's only found in, by faith in Jesus Christ. Eternal life is a present possession of those who are saved. It's something you can know tonight. You can know that for sure. As a matter of fact, back in chapter 3, I love what he said there in verse number 2. In chapter 3 and verse 2, John writes it like this, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 
Beloved, now are we the children of God. Are you one of those children? Amen. Are you a child of God? Rejoice in that. Amen. Rejoice in the fact that you can know that now, today, tonight. Verse number 12 says, He that hath the Son hath life. That's a very positive statement. The word hath means present tense. It means now. He that hath the Son hath life. That's a positive word. To have the Son means having Christ indwelling presence into your life as a believer. Just like he said in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Coming to him gives us everlasting life. But then the next part of that verse says the same thing in a more of a negative term. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. This is a very serious thought, isn't it? For a person that does not have Christ as Savior, they don't have life. Those who neglect or refuse to trust in Christ as their Savior are headed for a place called hell. I don't enjoy thinking about that, but it's a reality that faces some people today in our world who've never trusted Christ doesn't mean they're worse people than other people it just very simply means this they have not yet taken that step of faith to trust in christ as their personal savior believers are sure of heaven you're sure of heaven today as if you were already there but those who don't know him as savior today are also surely leading going to a place called hell jesus warned people about it too didn't he he said it's a terrible place of fire and torment where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. It is a, it's a real place. You don't want to go there. You don't have to go there. Trust in him. As a matter of fact, verse 13 gives the purpose for his writing here. As John was writing, he says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you can know that you have eternal life. He said, I write this for this reason. This is my purpose. I've written to you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you can know, K-N-O-W, you can know that you have eternal life. Maybe there's someone listening today or maybe you here in this room are wondering, do I really know I'm going to heaven? Maybe there's a question mark there for you. Maybe there's that thought in your mind, well, am I really ready? Am I really going there? Well, if you have any question at all, listen carefully, my friend. Salvation is not found in being a good man or a good woman. Salvation is not found in just, just uh, getting enough points. So, well, if I enough, do enough good deeds, then maybe I'll, I'll, get, I'll slide in the back door. no. As a matter of fact, it's only through the front door, and that's Jesus Christ, that you know you're going to heaven. Jesus has completed the work of salvation, and John was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write it all down and give us assurance. These things, he says, refers to not just what he says here, but everything that Jesus did. Jesus came, born of the Virgin Mary, lived a sinless life, it's all recorded for us in the four Gospels. And then in the end of each one of those four Gospels, they talked about his sacrificial death on the cross and how he was nailed there and bled and died for you and me that so we could have forgiveness. And then he was laid in a borrowed tomb and three days later arose from the grave. And today we have assurance because we believe these things, <laughs> these things. We believe these things. John wanted them to hear while hearing that they, so they could believe. And while believing, they could live. And while living, they should know they're saved. He even wrote in the last part of his, in the Gospel of John, a very 
important thought that he shared about why he wrote down what he did. In John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31, he said, And many more, and many signs, many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that, you, and that believing you might have life through his name. There's so much more than Jesus that Jesus did that it, there's not enough room to write it all down. But there's enough written down for you and I to know and believe. You can believe even today. He was writing to strengthen believers who might have been tempted to doubt to doubt the fact of their salvation and everlasting life. You and I can know eternal life is ours. We can know for sure because God's word tells us so. Now you may wake up tomorrow and you say, I don't feel saved today. Has that ever happened? You wake up in the morning, you don't feel saved. Maybe you don't feel a thing. <laughs> or maybe feelings change over time. That's where we have to base our salvation on this book what it says right here because you see this book is true it will not change and what this work what this says to us today is when you believe on Christ as your Savior no matter what else happens he's yours and you are his he belong to him and aren't you glad of that amen we can sing tonight to God be the glory and we can sing the songs of praise tonight because of what he has done. Another part of this chapter we're going to look at is in verse number 18. We're saved. We have assurance of that. We're sure of that. And we know we're saved because our lives are changed. Our lives are changed. Verse 18 says, And we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. And we know that we are of God, and that the whole world lieth in wickedness, or the wicked one. Well, this is an interesting statement, isn't it? At first glance, as you read this passage, you think, well now, wait a minute. That's kind of difficult to understand. He says, we know that whatsoever, whosoever is born of God sinneth not. What does he mean by that? The fact is, as we know and as you know, we know we're born again, children of God, but uh, we also know there's a possibility that we could stumble or slip into some kind of acts of sin or attitude of sin or disobedience. That's possible for you as a child of God. The meaning here is that sin is not to be a habitual characteristic of the child of God. In other words, when you sin, the Lord will not allow you to just get by with that. Can I be really plain with you? He's going to take you to the woodshed and give you a whooping. Amen? If you're a child of God, he will convict you of that sin until you confess it and forsake it. If some of the most miserable people in the world today are Christians who have let sin come into their life and they will not confess it. They'll say, oh, I can overcome it on my own. I'll do it my way. Well, that may have been the title of a song, but it's not the way to succeed in the child, in the child of God's life. The fact is, sin and the child of God sometimes meet but they cannot live together in harmony. You'll not be happy living in sin. If you're a child of God, now come on, amen, you're not going to be happy and let sin come in. You'll be miserable until you get rid of it. Confess it. Sin is not to be a habitual characteristic of a child of God. God chastens his children. Hebrews chapter 12 just tells us that. He's chastens every child every son that he receives we do know though the bible tells us in first john 1 9 if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness aren't you glad for that verse amen i'm glad for all the others 
but First John 1 9 is still equally important too, amen? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and give us peace and a renewed joy in our life. Jesus protects us. Notice it says there in verse 18. Let's look at it again. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. Interesting, it says that really what it, mean, what it means here is that Jesus protects and keeps us. Keepeth himself means the Lord Jesus will preserve us in his care. The Lord will keep you in his care. He said in John chapter 10, verse 27 and 28, that great passage about the good shepherd. He said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and they give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. We know that he holds us in, our, in his hand today. And that wicked one, it says, toucheth him not. In other words, Satan may attack God's children, but he cannot overcome them. He cannot overcome them because Jesus Christ holds us in his hand. In other words, Satan cannot touch you or attack. That word a touch means attach himself to you. There are some in the world today that very well may be attached to Satan. Their life is wrecked, their life is messed up, and, and talking about people that don't know Christ as Savior. And maybe they're following a life that's, that's um, very, very destructive. But if you're a child of God, Satan cannot attach himself to you because Jesus holds you in his hand. Aren't you glad of that? He keeps us in his care. And he goes on, John goes on in verse 20 and gives some additional truths to us here. He says, and we know that the Son of God is come and hath given us an, an understanding that we may know him that is true and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. These additional truths here for us that we can know. We know that the Son of God is come. We know that he came not only in his birth, but his, but his entire life, his teachings, his miracles. He, he did perform the miracles, amen? You read in the New Testament, you read the, the uh, gospel accounts where he would touch the, touch the blind and make, help them to see. He could heal the sick and raise up those that were crippled and lame and could not walk. He gave them the healing. We also believe in the crucifixion. I don't believe it was just a little swooning that he went through on the cross. I believe he really died. Jesus really died for us. We also believe that when he was buried three days later, the grave could not hold him. And he is alive today. And not only that, but in a few days after that, while standing on the Mount of Olives, he just ascended up into heaven. And the cloud received him out of the sight of his disciples that were gathered there. We believe and we know that the Son of God has come. And not only do we believe in his birth and his life, we believe in his, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and his coming again. He will be coming again. Jesus has given us an understanding. Notice he says, We know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. When you become a child of God, when you uh, trust in the Lord Jesus as your Savior, there will come into your life a desire to know him better. A desire to know him better. That's why coming to Sunday school is so important. We get in a Bible study class, come to the classes on Wednesday night like you're coming here to learn something more about him. Because when you're a child of God, you just want to know more about him and who he is and what he's done for you and for me. Notice he refers this thought of understanding as a desire to know him 
better and personally. Fellas, when you're driving down the street tomorrow, going to work or going down the road, remember he's there and he's concerned about you. He cares about you. Ladies, whatever you're doing tomorrow, whatever you face in tomorrow's uh, events, realize he cares about you personally. And we know him that is true. That means God the Father. It says, and we may know him that is true and that we are in him that is true. That's Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Paul said, he said, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. When you trust Christ, you become a new creation in him. He begins to work in your life to bring you into that place he wants you to be. Now, in the last verse of this chapter is interesting, isn't it? He says, little children. That's one of the favorite phrases that John uses for those he loves, little children. He loved them. He said, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Avoid idolaters' teaching. Things of the false teachers of the day in those days, the things that are going around in our world today, the false teachings of this day, and the sinful ways of the world and the devil. God gives us several assurances here in this, in this wonderful book, doesn't he? We're assured of forgiveness. I'm glad I'm forgiven, amen? Because of his wonderful sacrifice and the grace of God, he forgave me of my sin, saved my soul, and has allowed me to serve him. What a wonderful blessing, amen? And if he's done that for you, hallelujah, amen? What he's done for you is, is something priceless. We, we know we're in a relationship with him. We're sure of the truth. We're sure of the victory in Christ. We're sure of his love for us. And we can certainly be sure of our salvation. Do you know him? Have you helped someone else come to know him too? That's so vital today. We trust the Lord will bless and help in any and every way as we try to serve him together. Amen? And I'm so glad, Brother, Brother, uh, Brother Adams, aren't you glad? We're all glad we know this wonderful Savior. Amen? And how good he is. God bless you all tonight. Thank you for listening so well. All right.